The OSI model, or Open Systems Interconnect model, set out to perform one very, very important thing, and that's to give a framework or a basic series of steps and recommendations as to how traffic should actually be sent across a network. We're talking about from the application, the moment you click send on, on whatever app you're doing, like text messaging or email or whatever, the moment you click that button, how does that make its way down all the way through the network stack and then out the wire and make its way all the way across to another computer or another server and then it's received and sent back up to an application? That's what the OSI model set out to define or at least give recommendations as to how it should work. This served as a framework for protocols to build on top of. We know some of these protocols like TCP IP or Apple Talk. There were more models or, or protocols that were built on top of that, but the one that really reigns supreme today is the TCP IP model. So in this video, what we're doing is we're unpacking what the OSI model is and how TCP IP approached it by simplifying it just a little bit. Let's get going. Now, the OSI model is just a tremendous topic. There is a lot of content here on CBT Nuggets just surrounding the OSI model. I myself learned the OSI model from Keith Barker by clicking that search button up there and watching this content it's, you know, years ago at this point. But nonetheless, I learned this exact topic here. And the thing about it is, is it's just colossal. It's, it's a, a core piece of the entire Network Plus exam. If you don't understand the OSI model, uh, then you don't really understand how networking works. For the Server Plus exam, they really want this to be more of a refresher. Their assumption is, is that you already have some degree of experience with working with networks and the OSI model, even if it's very fundamental. But this is the entire foundation of how networks work anywhere in the world. If you go into a network in China, if you go into a network in Syria, if you go into a network in South Africa, UK, you name it, wherever you go, this is how data will be translated from an application all the way down to ones and zeros sent as electrical signals over the wire. This is how it's defined. There are seven layers, seven key layers to the OSI model. And if we're going to draw them out, we're going to write them out with these letters. I learned this from Keith Barker, so don't give me credit for this. Give Keith all the credit in the world for this one because I'm just borrowing it from him and his Network Plus content, which again is right up there. These layers can be written out as an acronym going from the bottom layer to the top layer. That is please do not throw sausage pizza away. I'll never forget it. I'll absolutely never, ever, ever forget it. Where if I were to kind of draw this out now, we're just going to kind of draw a stack of how these layers are going to be broken out. I'm going to kind of do it like this so that we can see each one of these layers written like so. There we go. This one will be layer one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And again, one more time, that's please do not throw sausage pizza away. And it goes all the way starting at the bottom with one up to seven. But the interesting thing is this is not where the data itself would originate. The data itself doesn't originate on layer one. Think about what you're doing here. You're sitting at your computer, you're smiling, you're sitting at your computer, and you might be typing up an email. So you're gonna have a two, maybe a CC, a subject, and a body, and then over here is a big send button, right? You're working within an application and the application is where the data is actually going to originate. When you click this send button, what is it really trying to do? It's trying to take all of this data that you've created here and send it out into a wire and send that data over to a remote computer or a remote server that knows how to receive and do something with that data. So if you were to think about it fundamentally, you would be starting at layer seven. The A in this case stands for application. This is the application that is originating the data. So when we think about the application layer, if you were actually looking 
at data that was intercepted as it was traveling over the wire, you would be able to see the actual payload of data. This is kind of what we're going to be thinking about when we think about layer seven. Now, layer six is called the presentation layer. The presentation layer is where we validate that all of the data that we're trying to send is going to work the way we want it to. It has to adhere to the correct kind of rules and the protocols that are going to be in play here. There's not too much that you need to know about the presentation layer outside of that. The next layer is the session layer. This is where it keeps track of if we're starting a new session or if we're trying to maintain a session, do we need to increment a session number? That way we know when we're replying to data. And collectively, lots of times, these three items are all kind of grouped together because these are items that are oftentimes handled entirely within the application or the operating system itself. The network itself, when it's, tr when it's carrying the data across the wire, doesn't really interact with anything layer five, six, or seven. So just know that for layer five, six, and seven, you oftentimes see these grouped together. But from here, if I kind of clear up the screen a little bit, when we move down into layer four, this is where it starts to get very seriously focused in on the network itself. Here we have what's called the transport layer. And oftentimes, this is what I like to refer to as kind of the bridging layer. When I say bridging, what I mean is this is what kind of links the application with the rest of the network stack because this is where we start to see ports or port numbers. And there is such a concept of well-known ports. For instance, when you browse a website using the HTTP protocol, the HTTP protocol is primarily focused on everything that goes on with layer five, six, and seven. But a server needs to be able to receive that data and know, oh, this belongs to the HTTP protocol. And that's what the transport layer does. This is where we would outline port 80. Or if we were using HTTPS, we would be outlining port 443. If we were trying to send an email using SNMP, this is where we would outline port 25. That way the server could receive the data and see, oh, this is for port 25. I know that belongs to my exchange server application that's running here on this computer, or that belongs to the Outlook client that is running here on my computer. Let me send that information up to the application so that it knows how to process layers five, six, and seven. So when you click the send button to send your email, it's going to start with the application. Then it's gonna move down to the presentation layer and make sure that it's formatting the data in such a way that it can be sent out towards the network. Then the session layer takes over and makes sure that we're establishing the right kinds of sessions within the data. Then the transport layer takes over and this is where we say, okay, what is going to be our source port and what is going to be the destination port that we're sending the traffic to. Next up, we have the network layer. And a lot of people will argue that this is the most important layer. In my opinion, they're all kind of equally important because if one of them doesn't work, then really none of it works and the network's not working. But this is one where a lot of people spend the most amount of their efforts because this is where we actually define our IP addresses. In the network layer, this is where you will start to see a source IP address and a destination IP address. Who is sending this packet? And who is it destined to? What computer and what server are interacting with each other? So this is what you see in the network layer. Then we move down here to layer two, which is the data link layer. A lot of other people would argue that this is their most important layer in the OSI model because this is the layer that they work in the most. The data link layer is where switching takes place. This is where layer two switches will move traffic from one device to the next. And then lastly, the physical layer takes over, and this is where the actual cabling takes place. This is where the traffic is actually sent over the physical wire. In other words, we take the data, the payload, the data, the, all the layers above it, and we translate it into little electrical pulses that one that could either be a one or a zero. A certain frequency and a certain little electrical signal sent over that copper wire will be received on the other end and that other end knows how to interpret that as a one or a zero and translate that binary into a full-blown data packet when it's all finally done. So when you actually click that send button on your email 
and it goes through this process right here, going down the OSI model, we call that, here, let's get rid of Knox for a second. We call that process encapsulation because as we move from one layer to the next, we're basically adding just a little bit more data into the original data packet. For instance, we had our original payload. Then we had our data and presentation. Then we had session and presentation and data. Then we added the layer four information, which was going to be our source and destination ports. So that would be plus session, plus presentation, plus data. You get what I'm saying here? Then we've got our layer three information on the outside of our layer four information, on the outside of our session information, on the outside, you get the idea here? Every single step down we go, we're encapsulating it in the next layer that we have. Now, why do we do that? Well, once we hit the send button here on our email, it goes out the computer and it gets received by another computer or another server. That computer is going to look at, okay, I've received this from the physical layer. Now I need to go up the stack. I need to de-encapsulate it as I go up the stack. So it'll say, okay, well, at layer two, I'm looking at the MAC addresses that are in play here. Is this destined for my MAC address? If the answer is yes, then we go up. Is it destined for my IP address? If the answer is yes, then we go up. Am I listening on this port? If the answer is yes, then we go up and we hand it off to the application at this time. So the OSI model is a pretty big and pretty complicated thing. It's all about how traffic gets moved from one step at a time throughout the entire process. Fundamentally, this is what it really looks like. I have computer A and it lives on a specific network. Let's call it network A. It communicates to a router that communicates to a server that lives on network B. When computer A hits that send button one more time, the application knows I need to send this email over here to this server. But this server is on an entirely different network from me. So what I really need to do is I need to get this data over here to a router so that the router knows how to forward it on towards the next destination, which is going to be the server. That's the beautiful thing about networking and these devices understanding what their IP address is, is they can quickly identify if we're already on the same network as our destination or if we need to get it to a router who can then forward it to the correct destination from there. So in this case, when we hit that send button on our email and the computer looks at its IP address and it looks at the IP address of the server that it's trying to send it to, it says, wait a minute, we're not on the same network. So what I really need to do is I need to get that over here to my router or what's known as my default gateway so that I can forward it on to the correct server. So the computer begins the encapsulation process. It goes from the application layer to the presentation layer to the session layer to layer four. For the destination port, since we're trying to send an email, it'll use something like the destination port of 25, which is the well-known SNMP port. For the source port, it'll use something totally random, like 20,000. Because the only thing that really matters here is using port 25 as the destination because that's the well-known port for emails. And when this arrives on this particular server, it's gonna arrive on port 25 and that server will go, wait a minute, that's for my email application, which is listening on port 25. Let me punt it up to them. Then it'll set the source IP address to be itself, which is gonna be whatever network A is, plus the client IP. And then the destination IP address is going to be the actual server that we're trying to get to. That's going to be network B plus the client address over here. Then lastly is how do we get this traffic over here to the router first who's going to be acting as the default gateway? Well, this is what layer two is all about. When we want to communicate on the same network with a device that lives on the same network, that's going to be like sending it directly to our default gateway because we're on the same network as our default gateway. So the source MAC address is going to be this computer's MAC address. I'll put computer MAC. And the destination MAC address is going to be the router MAC. So that data will be sent over to the router, and the router will say, well, yeah, I received this. I'm looking at it now going back up the stack, de-encapsulating the data, and I see the router MAC. That's me. This was destined for me. So let me now look at layer three information to determine if this data is still for me or if I need to forward it on. When it sees that the 
destination IP address is the server, it says, well, I'm not that IP address, but I am attached to the network that that IP address lives on. So let me just swap out the MAC addresses here real quick and then forward it out towards the server itself. So when it exits this interface here, the MAC addresses will now be changed to have the router's MAC address as the source and the destination will be the server's MAC address. The router is all about moving traffic from one network to the next. And as we go from one hop to the next or one device to the next, we just change the MAC addresses on the fly. So the source IP address and the destination IP address never really change, but the source MAC address and the destination MAC address could change at every single device that it passes through. So keep that in mind because that's a big one. So the whole idea with the OSI model was this was just a model. This wasn't the exact protocol that says this is how traffic must flow. This was more like a step-by-step -step feel uh, for how traffic could be logically organized and processed as it moved through a network. A lot of different protocols built on top of the OSI model and TCP IP was one of them, but it was like, that's too many layers. We could simplify that a lot. With TCP IP, if I were to write it out, the interesting thing is, is it combines layer two and layer one into one gigantic link layer. Layer three became known as the network layer. So it didn't actually change at all. <laughs> layer four was known as the transport layer, also didn't change at all. And then everything above it was just grouped into one layer, the application layer. The OSI model was basically saying, we're really only focused on layer four and layer three. Everything that happens above that is the applications doing. And everything that happens below here is really mostly layer two. That's really what's going on here because layer one isn't something that we can adjust really easily or that we really adjust ever in the wild. So we're just gonna call it the link layer and you can just consider that as we're really focusing on layer two. So the TCP IP model really just abbreviated the OSI model and how the traffic is actually originated and flowing through uh, from application to the end. But it all logically follows the exact same processes as the OSI model. Now again, this was supposed to be more of a refresher as to how networks work and how the OSI model works. I can't encourage you enough to spend the extra hour or two going through the network content, network plus content here on CBT Nuggets that covers in detail how the OSI model works with more in-depth examples. This was just the refresher that you would need for server plus. So this has been the OSI model and TCP IP. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.